Anjali Kajo here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Obama has dispatched George Mitchell on his first trip as Middle East envoy. Mitchell set to begin in Egypt today, followed by Israel, the occupied West Bank, Jordan, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. Speaking at the White House, Obama said Mitchell will be charged with bringing about genuine progress. The charge that Senator Mitchell has is to engage vigorously and consistently uh, in order for us to achieve genuine progress. Uh, and when I say progress, not just photo ops, but progress that is concretely felt by people on the ground, so that people feel more secure in their lives, so that they feel uh, that the hopes and dreams and aspirations of their children can be met. Uh, that is going to be our task. It is not something that we're going to be able to do overnight. But I am absolutely confident that if the United States is engaged in a consistent way and an early, in, uh, in early fashion, uh, that we can make genuine progress. Uh, now, understand that Senator Mitchell is going to be fully empowered by me and fully empowered by Secretary Clinton. So when he speaks, he will be speaking for us. Uh, and I'm hopeful that. Uh, during this initial trip, one of the earliest uh, initiatives that we have taken diplomatically, that not only is he uh, able to communicate effectively how uh, urgent we consider the issue, uh, but uh, that we're also going to be able to listen and to learn uh, and to find out what various players in the region uh, are thinking. Uh, and more immediately, we hope that uh, Senator Mitchell will be able to give us some ideas in terms of how we can solidify the ceasefire, ensure Israel's security, also ensure that uh, Palestinians in Gaza uh, are able to uh, get the basic necessities they need and that they can see a pathway towards uh, long-term uh, development uh, that will be so critical in order for us to achieve uh, a lasting peace. George Mitchell has no immediate plans to visit the Gaza Strip site of the three-week-long U.S.-backed attack that killed more than 1,300 people, injured more than 5,000. A State Department spokesperson said Mitchell might make it to Gaza. Well, my next guest has just returned from Gaza. She witnessed the Israeli attack. Kathy Kelly is executive director of Voices for Creative Nonviolence, veteran peace activist, founder of Voices in the Wilderness, has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize several times. She joins us in our Firehouse Studio. Welcome to Democracy Good Now, morning. Kathy. How long were you in Gaza, and how did you get in? We were there, Audrey Stewart and I, for a total of six days. And we had entered, after going back up to Cairo and getting an official stamp letter, you had to swear before the United States Embassy in Cairo that you were going in on your own responsibility. And what did you see? Where did you go? We went to Rafah, and we were very fortunate, a family that had fled from their own home and was living in a home that was lent to them by in-laws invited us to stay with them. And we were um, uh, immediately outside the area where people were told to evacuate. And so I, it, we timed it. Every 11 minutes, there would be a huge bomb thudding down on, on the neighborhood. Uh, this was very close to where the tunnel industry what had been um, in full uh, activity prior to the December 27th attacks. And so we heard many of the bombs falling. We heard Apache helicopters firing. And then um, it traveled with young people, students, up to Gaza City after the ceasefire was in place and the roads had been cleared, and, and could see just how stunned the students were at, at the extent of the devastation. And then from there, we, we visited inside the hospital, the burn unit, and in a major uh, Shifa Hospital in Gaza, and then went up to Beit Lahia and Audrey over to Tufa to, to further see the extent of the damage. Speaking with doctors in the hospital, seeing patients, what struck you most? The doctors said that the majority of their patients were non-military. They were civilians, grandmothers, teenagers, children. Um, they were shaking with rage, honestly, because the world had watched for 22 days while this affliction just went on and on. They talked about patients lying on the floor, dying before their eyes because they couldn't open up operating rooms. They didn't have enough materials to try to save all of the people who were coming in desperate need. Um, they said they'd never seen injuries like this before. Doctors with 15, 20, 30 years of practice, uh, particularly with regard to the burns, they've now, um, they believe, proven that white phosphorus 
was used. Um, they had sent uh, one patient's tissue out for a biopsy in Egypt, and elements of white phosphorus were found in the tissue. And um, what actually kills people when the white phosphorus, which is poisonous, goes into the circulatory system is that the liver can't process it, and two of their patients died of cardiac arrests after being transported to Egypt. They also told about um, the, the way that surgery, sur surgeons had to work as teams, a vascular surgeon, a neurosurgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, um, trying desperately to save lives. And the, um, the extent of the, um, the, the wounds and that, that each patient came in with, that they said was like nothing they had ever experienced before. I wanted to ask you, Kathy Kelly, about this brewing controversy in Britain. Two of Britain's major broadcasters, the BBC and Sky, are continuing to come under criticism for refusing to air a charity appeal for the victims of the Israel attack on Gaza. The appeal was put together by the Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, DEC, which includes 13 of Britain's main charities. Uh, the DEC asked broadcasters to air the three-minute appeal during prime time on Monday, seeking donations for Palestinians affected by the conflict. The appeal aired on many British channels last night, but BBC and Sky refused. This is an excerpt of the appeal. The children of Gaza are suffering. Many are struggling to survive. Homeless and in need of food and water. Today, this is not about the rights and wrongs of the conflict. The hospitals have been overwhelmed with the number of casualties and need more resources to treat them. This is why the DEC has launched this appeal. Again, the BBC's come under broad criticism for its decision not to air the appeal. This is Caroline Thompson, chief operating officer for the BBC. It is a matter of a big national, international controversy. Uh, there is a big debate about the rights and wrongs of the war and the causes and so on. Um, and we would want that to have stabilized and the situation on the ground to have stabilized before we could reconsider and feel it was something we could do. And here is what the BBC's Director General Mark Thompson had to say. We believe that the BBC's reputation for impartiality is so important and so integral to the BBC's reputation and its, its, its trustworthiness here and around the world that it's very important that we adhere strictly to our principles. Um, again, the charities behind the appeal include the Red Cross, Oxfam, Save the Children and Christian Aid. Kathy Kelly, your response. Well, the, many of those charities had, even prior to the December 27th attacks, issued a scathing report showing how the economic war, the state of siege that had been imposed on Gaza, was something that was in violation of international law. Uh, I think that these charities have had on-the-ground experiences, and they should certainly be listened to. Surely the humanitarian is political. That's just a reality that we should all accept. But I think that um, the, the journalistic uh, integrity would be most respected if, in fact, there would be clear reporting on the ways that these assaults the Israeli assaults on a civilian population, 50 percent of whom are children, violated international law and any standards of human decency, and I believe should be examined under the questions of genocide. Israel said that they would stop during that attack if Hamas stopped launching the rockets. What was the response of Palestinians inside? Has Hamas increased in popularity or decreased? It's difficult to answer that question. I myself sense that when people heard the um, word victory, they um, that gave people pause. I mean, you couldn't look at the extent of the damage and devastation and the amount of uh, time it'll take to repair and, and speak of victory if, in fact, you were going to live in that situation for a long time. Um, but I, I think that the, the rage that was felt um, in, in every conversation that I heard in terms of the international community allowing this devastation to go on for 22 days without stepping in was a cause of um, ongoing chagrin. Now, how that will affect Hamas's political uh, standing, uh, it's, it's difficult to say. How did this compare to your experience of other conflict situations? I mean, you're famous, Kathy, for uh, traveling the world to conflict zones. Um, you were in Iraq before the invasion and during. You were in Lebanon in 2006. You know, in Iraq, when people were trapped under the economic sanctions, it seemed as though there was nothing that average, ordinary people could do except be punished again and again and again. I was impressed by the tunnel industry. 
in the town of Rafah, which is uh, bisected by the border, people have found a way to deal with a state of siege that was imposed on them, imposing collective punishment. And they created a, a network of tunnels so that actually the first day that people could kind of basically come out after the bombing had ended, the stalls in Rafah were pretty stacked with goods. And I thought, well, how did they ever get there? And people just said the tunnels. Uh, and so I think where there's a tremendous need, people don't like the idea of burrowing underground in order to get food and water and benzene and, and needed goods. But, but I think that there's a great survival ethos.